Welcome, my students. Today, we will continue talking about the SAAT leaks for 20 to, uh, 2022. So let's get started. Question number 49. If you will donate blood to your friend whose blood group is O, your blood group must be A, B, A, B, or O. Think about the answer. And okay, of course, the correct answer will be D, which is the blood group O. As the, as the person that you will donate to him has a blood group O, so the donor must be also in the same blood group O. And the reason is, as you know, the blood group O has no antibodies, no anti antigens, sorry no antigens on the surface of the red blood cell. So this blood group can donate to all of other blood groups, can donate to AB, to B, and to O. Why there is no antigens, okay? Why this blood group has both antibody A and antibody B in their plasma? So if any blood group that want to donate to the blood group A, the blood group, I'm sorry, O, the blood group O will not receive the blood except from its own, except from its own. Reason, if the AB donate to O, the AB has anti A and anti B on the surface of the RBC, and in the plasma of the blood group O has both antibody A and antibody. So the blood coagulation will be occurred and the person will die. And the blood group B has the antigen B, on the, red, on the surface of the red blood cell. And if it's donated to O, it will coagulate with the uh, antibody B, which is present in the plasma of the patient or the receiver, which is the blood group O in this case. And if the blood group A is donating to a blood group O, also the surface of the RBCs of the blood group A has antigen A, and also will coagulate with the antibody uh, A, which is found in the plasma of the uh, reception uh, of the blood group O. So the only answer that is accepted here, and now we know why, is the blood group O. Question number 50. Which system transmits the message that you have a pebble in your shoe? A, peripheral nervous system, B, endocrine system, C, central nervous system, D, skeletal system. Which one of the system will transmit the message, okay, of a bible that you have in your shoe. The correct answer here is the peripheral nervous system. Reason, let's extend our explanation by saying, here we have the nervous system. Nervous system is being divided into CNS or central nervous system that has the brain and the spinal cord. The brain and the spinal cord, its function is to transmit, or is, is to interpret, inter, interpret the data, that processing, okay? While we have other, okay, part of the nervous system, which is the peripheral nervous system or the PNS, the peripheral nervous system, its function is to, yes, first of all, it's um, made up of the cranial nerves, cranial nerves, those are the nerves extended and emerged from the brain. And we have the spinal nerves, spinal nerves. Those nerves that are extended from the spinal cord. And functionally, the peripheral nervous system is made up of, or it's been divided into so, somatic nervous system, which is voluntary. You can decide, okay, to, uh, you can control the actions, okay, that uh, under the somatic nervous system while the autonomic nervous system, it is automated, it is involuntary, you cannot control those actions. And even the autonomic nervous system is being divided into sympathetic nervous system, in which it's con uh, controlling and taking over the body while stress, while action, while uh, you are excited, while are very happy, very sad, playing, running, okay? And on the other hand, we have the parasympathetic nervous system, 
that it takes over after the sympathetic in order to normalize the body and retaining back the body at rest or to normal, okay? And it's take over the body while the body is calm, while the body is relaxed, while you are sleeping, okay? This is the nervous system. Here he said, a people in your shoe. So the people is uh, in your shoe. So the nerve that will transmit the signals are parts of the peripheral nervous system because mostly they are sensory nerves or sensory, uh, yeah, sensory nerve that will be entering to the nervous system, which is the spinal cord in this case. But the message will be transmitted from your leg or in this case from your shoe to the spinal cord via a sensory sensory nerve so the sensory nerve is part of the peripheral nervous system not central nervous system question number 51 what is the figure below food chain food web biosphere biomass it's very easy this is an interconnected food chain which is a food web so the food web is interconnected food chains Exactly. Question number 52. Differentiation between animal and plant cell can be done during the mitotic division. A, spindle fibers. B, disappear of plasma membrane. C, duplication and separation of DNA. D, absence of centrioles. Of course, you know that the plant cell do not have centrioles. So the correct answer is absence of centrioles. Question number 53. When you chew a piece of bread, the enzyme affecting on its digestion is A, trypsin, B, lipase, C, amylase, D, bipsin. Of course, the salivary gland secretes saliva, saliva pour in the mouth, and in the mouth there is a salivary amylase enzyme. And the salivary amylase enzyme acts on the starch in the food and break it down into disaccharide maltose. Question number 54. Explanation of, the, of a natural phenomenon based on observations and inquiries a long time. This statement de uh, depicts theory, hypothesis, conclusion, scientific law. Actually, explanation is yeah, it's considered a theory. The explanation for a phenomenon is a, a theory, okay? And it's accepted as long as the theory is explaining the natural phenomena. But if there is any tangible evidence contradicting this explanation, the theory will no longer be accepted in the, in the scientific society. Yeah, hypothesis is a testable, yes, uh, proposition or assumption, conclusion. This is the end of by the um, or after experiment okay scientific law of course the law is the highest thing in the uh in the scientific method and it is not being mentioned in this question so the answer here is the theory question number 55 what causes the plant to bend this plant bend towards the light here is the light source a oxen B, gibbelins, C, cytokinin, D, ethylene. Of course, the plan will be pinned because of the auxins. Okay. First of all, the process by which the plant's slow growth movement towards the stimuli, and in this case is light, is known as tropism and phototropism in particular. And this because of the auxin. Let's extend it a little bit. We have hormones that are chemical messengers produced in one part of an organism that affect the activity of the cell in another part. Auxins make plant cells in the apical meristem or the growant becomes larger, longer, and this causes the plant growth. In addition to this, auxins control some of the tropism, okay, which is the slow growth movement of plant towards or away from a specific stimuli. If the stimuli is they light, it will be known as phototropism. If this um, stimuli is the gravity, it will be gravitropism or geotropism. If this okay, stimulus is the touch, it will be thigmotropism. 
and those are the three times that we have in the tropism. And it's been affected by the uneven distribution of a plant hormone known as oxen. The gibbelin is one of the plant hormones. It didn't come in the uh, yesterday or last uh, exam, but it is produced big change in the size, increases significantly the plant. For example, they, uh, the plant which is known as agava americana, okay, the flower stalk can be raised up to 50, 40 feet, which is 12 meters long. Why? Because the plant secretes the gibbelins that causes the plant stalk to become extremely large. The ethylene is very famous. Okay, it's a gaseous hormone that is produced by the fruit and causes them to be ripened. And we can make use of it in order to fasten the process of ripening the fruit. Cytokinin, it is also a plant hormone. From its name, cytokinin it play a role in the cytokinesis of the cell cycle. As you know, in the cell cycle, we have the uh, first, we have the interface. Okay, all of this is the interface. Here we have G1, then we have G2, then we, I'm sorry, S, then we have G2. This is S or synthesis phase. Okay, and all of those are interphase. And this is the meiosis. Supposed to be less than this, by the way. Okay, I will redo it in order to be much more okay, scientific. I'm not accepting this. Okay, it should be less than this. Okay, if I draw it like this, okay, only, only this part will be the meiosis and all of this part will be, yes. This is the G1 is G2, and here is M, or the mitosis. And mitosis is, yeah, divided into two. First is known as the nuclear division, nuclear division. And the nuclear division is the mitosis itself, mitosis. Okay. And then, or it's called karyokinesis, by the way, called karyokinesis. Yes, karyokinesis. And here we have cytoplasmic division or cytokinesis, cytokinesis. And here is the point I'm looking for, cytokinesis. It's being controlled by cytokinin. So the process is physically dividing the cells into two and ending the, um, the, the cell cycle. So this is being stimulated and regulated by the cytokinin. So stimulate the process of cytokinesis, which is the last stage of the life cycle. Yes, final stage of the cell division. Yeah, so this is a, a one of the plant hormones as well. And all of those are the plant hormones we need to know to the level of the SAAT biology. Question number 56, when cross green B plant, Y small, Y small, with the yellow B plant, Y capital, Y capital, the first generation will be Y capital, Y small, Y small, Y small, Y capital, Y capital, Y capital, Y capital, Y small, Y small. As I always saying, if you are in doubt, get it out. How can you do this? Bonnet squared. So the bonnet squared, as I told you before, four, three lines, two lines. Let's do it together. He one, sorry, yeah, here's the answer. Yeah, one, two, three. Okay, one, two. And here is the male, here is the female. So let's assume that this Y small, Y small. For example, this is the male. And the female here is the Y is the Y capital, Y capital. So here is Y capital, Y capital. Here is Y small, Y small. Y small with Y capital will be Y capital, Y small. Y small with Y capital will be Y capital, Y small. Y small with Y capital will be Y capital, Y small. Y small with Y capital will be Y capital, Y small. So it will be 100% Y capital, Y small, which is heterozygous, Okay, dominant, okay, for the character, which is in this case, yellow. Yes. Yeah, here is the same. This is a uh, monohybrid inheritance. <clears throat> you can go through it if you want, in order not to waste our time and to make use of it. Question number 57, the reaction of the living organism is, the reaction of a living organism is A, stimulus, B, response, C, adaptation, D, accumulation. Of course, the reaction for any stimulus is considered a response. 
exactly. So the response is a reaction that actually occur after a particular stimulus. Yes. Question number 58. Which of the following controlled by the sympathetic action? Which of the following controlled by the sympathetic action? A, increase the secretion of mucus. B, increase the secretion of saliva. C, dilate the eye pupil. D, decrease the heartbeats. Sympathetic is under the autonomic peripheral nervous system. Yes. So it will be dilating the eye pupil. Let's extend the explanation. As you know, when the body is under the sympathetic action, the adrenal glands, here the kidney, above it, there is adrenal or above the kidney gland. This adrenal gland secretes roughly about 40 different hormones. The one that we are pointing out here is the adrenaline. Adrenaline will be poured in the bloodstream, circulating all over the body to reach in the target organs. And the first here of the target organs in our question is the eye, the dilating its pupil. So more light will be entering, so the vision will be much more precise. And the heartbeat will be increased. Why? Because there is a high demand for oxygen and nutrients. So more blood will be, yes, will be pushed to the cells with oxygen and nutrients. And in the same way, more carbon dioxide and waste products will be taken away from the cells as a result of the process of aerobic respiration. Why the body needs aerobic respiration? In this case, because the body needs to release energy in order to be used for the contraction of the muscles that are doing the action. And the airways will be dilated, so more air can get in, so more uh, sufficient amount of, uh, of air that help in the process of gas exchange because there is a high demand of oxygen. And also the sweat gland will increase its secretion in order to secrete more of the sweat that has a cooling effect to the body and decreases the body temperature, which is increases while the person is in the stress. And the liver as well, okay, under the action of the glucagon hormone, will convert the stored glycogen and convert it into glucose. This glucose will be released in the blood in order to increase the blood glucose level. So the blood glucose level increased, so more glucose will be distributed to the cells which is needed along with oxygen in order to undergo the process of the uh, aerobic respiration to release energy that needed for the action of contraction of the muscles during the sympathetic action. And the system, the digestive system will be decreasing its activity. And the adrenal gland, we started talking about it. Uterus, the uh, vagina will be contract. And urinary system, the urinary bladder will be relaxed in order to have or to retain more of the urine, okay, during the process the person or the body is under stress or action. And all of those under the sympathetic autonomic peripheral nervous system. Question number 59. The type of the cavity in the following figure is A, eucelum, B, pseudocelum, C, acelum, D, whole celum. Yes, exactly. Here is pseudocelum. Let's explain. Let's explain it. First of all, here we have ectoderm. Ectoderm. And here we have endoderm. And in between them, there is mesoderm. And here there is a cavity. This cavity is not fully surrounded by mesoderm from all of the direction to be true cavity or eucelum, but it is a cavity. So we are name it as a false cavity, false cavity or false in Latin known as pseudo cavity is coelum. Okay. So pseudo coelum. Let's extend the explanation a little bit in order to give you a tangible sort of understanding about this topic just in case it came in any other question. And it came basically in topic number three, which is talking about the invertebrates. Here we have, what is the meaning of the coelum, first of all? It is a fluid-filled cavity that is surrounded fully. Here is the key word, by the way, fully. Surrounded fully. 
with mesoderm. So let's start by the acylomates. Here is ectoderm, here is endoderm, here is mesoderm. Are there anything between the endo and mesoderm? Nothing. So it is known as acylomate, and A means not. The letter A means not. So they are not acylomates. There is no coelom, lack of coelom. And it's only one group of invertebrate, which is flatworms. So this is the process of recalling for you. Okay, acylomate, only flatworm. And let's go for the pseudosolomate to ease even the process of recalling. Outside here, we have ectoderm. Inside, we have endoderm. And in the middle, there is mesoderm. And surrounding a cavity, okay, which is known as pseudocelum. But this cavity is not fully surrounded from all of the sides by the mesoderm, only from one side. Here, directly the endoderm. So it is a cavity, but it's not true cavity. So it is known as pseudocelum. And it's only one invertebrate, which is the nematoda or the round worms. Round worms or the nematoda are the only pseudocelumate. All of the rest of the organisms are, yes, eusolumate. All of the invertebrates and the vertebrates are eusolumate. Eu mean true. Eu means true. So they have true coelom. Let's figure it out. Outside we have ectoderm. Inside we have endoderm. And here is the mesoderm that is fully surrounding the cavity, fully surrounded from every side, from, from all of the sides, it is fully surrounded. So it is a true cavity. It is a true coelom. That's why it is known as true solomate or a true cavity or an eusolomate. Okay. And all of the rest are eusolomate. That is the process of the recalling for you. So the acylomate, only flat worms, pseudosolomate, only round worm. The rest are automatically eusolomate, such like anilida, mollusks, arthropoda, echinoderms, and all of the chordates that you have, invertebrate chordates, and you have the rest of the chordate, fish, reptiles, amphibians, birds, and mammals. Question number 60. What are the type of muscles that lie in the stomach in humans? A, uh, smooth voluntary, B, striated involuntary, C, smooth involuntary, D, striated voluntary. Of course, the correct answer is C, which is smooth and involuntary. There is no smooth voluntary, by the way, and there is no uh, striated, there is voluntary and involuntary. Let's extend the explanation. First of all, here is the shape of the muscle. Uh, the smooth muscles that are lining the stomach. They are smooth, and all of the smooth muscles are involuntary. So let's extend it even a little bit. We have three types of muscles. Number one, we have skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles that are found on the uh, muscle attached to bones, okay, and move in our skeletal system. They are voluntary, and they are striated. They are striated. Striated means have stripes. Yeah, like this. And then we have the involuntary muscles. Involuntary muscles has two types. Number one is the cardiac muscle. The cardiac muscle is involuntary, but it is also striated, by the way. It is striated involuntary. So there is striated voluntary, the skeletal, and there is striated involuntary, such like the cardiac muscle. It is a muscle that never stops it is a muscle that never get tired. And then we have the smooth muscles and all of the smooth muscles are involuntary. Such like the muscle that lining the gastrointestinal tract or the alimentary canal, starting by the, yes, here the esophagus, the stomach, the duodenum, the duodenum, the ileum, the colon, the rectum, and even that lining the blood vessels, the artery and veins, and also that lining the uh, urinary bladder and even the Yes, the female, um, the female uterus, all of those are smooth muscles. Question number 61. The movement structure used by the living organism in the figure is A, pseudobode, B, cilia, the flagella, contractile vacuum. What is the movement structure? What is the locomotion okay, in this uh, organism? First of all, if you know the organism, you will know the answer. This organism is amoeba, and amoeba is a, uh, among us, the uh, sarcodina, 
and the are moving by Suru boat. Yes, it's very important point because it come uh, it came before in many many questions. By the way, let's talk about it a little bit. Let's extend it a little bit. Those are the Suru boat, by the way. Those are this. This is the Suru boat. If I extend it, it is a proper figure. This this is the picture, the exact picture that came in the exam. Okay, but this is a, a much more detailed and okay clear um, diagram. Here is the Suru board. Okay, Suru means, yes, the word Suru means false. Bodhya means feet. So a Suru board will be used by this amoeba in order to move. Okay, so let's extend it even further more. Okay, we have here the animal like protest. Animal like protest, I can't write it here. Animal like. Okay, protest. Or the protozoa. Protozoans. The protozoan has phylum number one, which is sarcodina, and the common name is sarcodines, and the locomotion or the movement structure. All of those movements came in the, in the exam before, all of them. So watch out. So they move by the pseudobodia. Example, amoeba, and those are the pseudobod. Then we have the ciliophora or the ciliates that move by cilia. An example is the paramecium, and here are the cilia that covering the paramecium. Then we have sarcomastigophora or zoomastigenia. And by the way, the word that came in the exam is the common name, which is zooflagellate. And it's very easy because they're telling you the locomotion. Why? It is mentioned here, flagellate. So it's moved by flagella, such like tribanosoma. And tribanosoma moved by the flagella. This is the flagella. We have two kinds of the tribanosoma. Tribanosoma that cause the um, sleep, African sleep and sickness disease that is being transmitted by tsetse fly, the question that we answer in the previous question that came in the last trial of the exam. And we have also another type of tribanosome which cause in the American sleep and sickness disease or Chagas disease. And they are being transmitted by another, yes, a bit uh, text, not by the CT fly. So watch out. Then we have the epicomplexin or sporozoan. And this word that came in the exam before, okay, sporozoan. They have known, okay, uh, structure by which they can move in the other form. So how they are moving? Moving by gliding. Moving by gliding. Okay. In they, yes, in the body fluid of the host. All of them are parasitic here. Yes. Except for some freshwater, okay, form of the amoeba. Question number 62. Organism of three chambered heart. A, amphibian. B, fish. C, bird. D, mammal. Yes, for sure. The three chambered heart organism here is the amphibian. Yes. Fish has two chamber, has two chambers. Bird and mammal have four chambers. Yes, fish here has only one ventricle and one uh, atrium. But the uh, amphibian has two atria, two atria, and one ventricle. Yes. Bird and mammal, they have four, two atria, two ventricles. Question number 63, what is the part of the body? What is this part of the body? And he brought you this picture, real picture in the exam. And here is just image. Um, it's a diagram that tells what is this, a little bit colored, but this is the picture that exactly come in the exam. A, shoulder, B, clavicle, C, ribs, D, sternum. And of course, this is the breastbone or the sternum bone. This is called breastbone or sternum bone. If I extend the explanation a little bit in order to give you a full understanding about the axial and appendicular skeletal system, the skeletal system is divided into two parts, two, two, two basic parts, skeletal system. So we have axial skeletal system that is made up of four major parts. First part is the bones that make the skull. Second part is the bone that make the rib cage. Third part is the bone that make the vertebral colon. The fourth is the bone of the sternum or breastbone called sternum. And in some textbooks, they refer to it as 
breastbone. And then we have the appendicular skeletal system that is also made up of four major groups of bones, okay? First is the bones of the upper limb, okay, number one, that is being attached to the axial skeletal system by a girdle which is known as shoulder girdle. Then we have the bones of the lower limb, that is being attached to the axial skeletal system by bones of girdle, which is known as pelvic girdle. So axial skeletal system has four major groups of bones and appendicular skeletal system also has four basic groups of bones. So watch this out. Question number 64, cells that converted from non-specialized to specialized cells are A, stem cells, B cells, T cells, memory cells. For sure, the answer here is the stem cells. In the level of SA80, he never asked about the differentiation between the different sort of the stem cells, but just in order to be um, have a solid understanding and to extend our explanation, I'm going to say here that the stem cell classified into three basic groups, totipotent, pluripotent, and multipotent. Toti in Latin means all. So this is a stem cell that can give rise into all of the cells, even itself, even itself. And nothing can do this except the fertilized egg. Nothing in the body can do it except this cell. Then we have pluripotent. Plure means, yes, many. Okay. Multi also means many, by the way. Plure here means a lot. I'm sorry. So it can give rise into almost any cell except, except the fertilized egg. So the blastula, for example, that have inner cells, the inner cells are known as embryonic stem cells. Those can give rise into any kind of our bodies, can, give, can differentiate into 200 different body cells, 200 different body cells, except the fertilized egg cannot do or cannot differentiate into fertilized egg. Even it came from fertilized egg, but it is differentiated from it and cannot give it back to the fertilized egg, okay? So it can give nerve, nerve cells, skin cells, muscle, kidney, cartilage, bone, liver, anything out of 200 different cells that we have in our body, they can give rise into it. Then we have the multipotent or it's known as adult stem cells. Other stem cells, let's make an example that will come. It will be, I think, the one before the last question today is the uh, blood stem cells or the blood other stem cells that found in the bone marrow. They are in the bone marrow. They can give rise into only a closely related cells from one family, such like in our example, can give rise into the red blood cells, white blood cells, and platelets, and all of them are blood cells. So closely related family of the cells. So this is a detailed explanation and differentiation of the stem cells classification, just in case came an exam. Question number 65. Medusa form is common in which group? A, flatworms. B, nematodes. C, cnidarians. D, spoons. Of course, the Medusa form is common in the Nidarians. Yes, let's extend our explanation. Here we have two figures, and each one of them representing a dominated phase. Let's talk about the pulley form. This is the pulley form or the vase shaped okay, uh, phase. It is the dominated for the sea anemones and hydras. Okay, such like this organism, that most of its life it's in the pulley form, which is a vase shaped or a tube like structure and usually attached to the rock by a basal cell, which is known as a semen, a semen cell that's created a sticky substance. Then we have the medusa form, medusa form or the pill shaped, okay, or an umbrella shaped, okay, and most of the jellyfish life cycle is dominated by the. Okay, the jelly, the uh, medusa form. Question number 66. The relationship between bees and flowers is considered A, mutualism, B, commensalism, C, parasitism, D, competition. 
course, it is a mutualism that both of them get benefited. And as we told, as we discussed before, the mutualism is a symbiotic relationship in which one organism benefited and the other organism benefited as well. The commensalism is a symbi symbiotic relationship in which one organism benefited and the other organism neither benefited nor harmed, or it is a win-nothing relationship. Brutalism, win-win relationship. Parasitism is a symbiotic relationship in which one organism benefiting on harming other organism. So one organism benefit is the parasite and another organism is being harmed, which is the host. And here is the parasite. And the relation between them is known as host parasite relationship. Question number 67, where is the urea formed? A, liver, B, kidney, C, bladder, D, pancreas. Where is the urea form? First of all, what the meaning of urea? If you know what is the meaning of it, you will know where and uh, how it will be made. For sure, the answer is the liver. If we extend the explanation a little bit, I'm going to say that the story begins when we have excess amount of amino acid. So if you have excess amount of amino acid, then it will be uh, deaminated, the amination. The word D means removal. Okay, so the removal of the amino group. Where is the amino group? Here is the structure of the amino acid. We have carboxylic group, we have amino group, we have alkyl group or side chain, okay? And we have hydrogen. Here is the, the uh, amino group, and this link will be broken down, and this NH2 will be removed. This NH2, yes, here, two of NH3 in this case, plus carbon dioxide, will make one urea molecule. The urea will be transferred to the kidney via the blood, and in the nephrons that are found in the kidney, the urea will be ultrafiltrated, then it will move through the Bilvis, then to the ureter, and from the ureter, it will move to the bladder, and from the bladder through the urethra, and from the urethra to outside of the body. Question number 68. A scientist discovered a new organism and concluded it was prokaryote based on what? A, small vacuoles, B, there is ribosome in the cytoplasm, C, presence of cell wall, D, lack of membrane-bounded organelle. Yes, for sure, it is not a new question. It is the lack of membrane-bounded organelles. If we extend the explanation a little bit, we're going to say that the difference between the prokaryotes and eukaryotes is the prokaryote lack of membrane-bounded organelle. So there is no Golgi apparatus, there is no chloroplast, there is no mitochondria, there is no nucleus, and there uh, DNA is, is scattered in the cytoplasm in a place known as nucleoid. And in addition to this, its DNA is circular and it has a very, very small okay, uh, size in comparison to the eukaryote, which is a gigantic cell and has membrane bounded organelles. So there is nucleus, there is vacuole, there is chloroplast, there is mitochondria. And the DNA of the eukaryote is linear. And in addition to this, the size of the eukaryote is gigantic in comparison to the prokaryotes. Question number 69, which of the following is the correct bonding between nitrogen spaces? A, B, C, D. Use the urban Chargaff base pairing rule and you will find it out. If I remind you by the urban Chargaff base pairing rule, I'm going to say that in DNA, and we have now to make a differentiation a little bit between yeah, DNA, and RNA. In RNA, adenine paired by a double hydrogen bond with uracil, guanine paired with a triple hydrogen bond with cytosine. In, ad in DNA, adenine paired with thiamine, guanine paired with cytosine. And here is the um, Erwin Chargaff Pispiri rule. If you, um, uh, if you okay, implement this rule here, you're going to find that all of them are incorrect except for. Yes, except for point number uh, number A, okay, which is the only one 
correct here, in which they adenine pair with, go, with thiamine, uh, cytosine pair with guanine. Here, uh, thiamine with guanine, no. A with C, no, so it is uh, excluded. U with, with C, no, so it's excluded. A with U, no, so it is excluded. And here is the only accepted correct answer. Question number 70. Which of the following causes decrease in the ozone layer of the atmosphere? Carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, chlorofluorocarbons, the nitrogen oxides. All of them are pollutants for the uh, causing air pollution, but the ozone is being basically affected by the CFCs or the chlorofluorocarbons. Yes. And in some textbook, they say they named the CFCs chlorofluorocarbons. Question number 71. All of the following process, processes describing the mechanical digestion in human except A, mixing food with saliva, B, bite and chew food in the mouth, C, contraction of muscle, of stomach muscle, mixing the food. Um, the last one is pushing food by the peristalsis of the small intestine. Yes, surely all of them are mechanical except for, yes, mixing of food with saliva because this is chemical. Because there is a salivary amylase enzyme with the saliva that play a chemical digestion process in the mouth. So the mixing of food with, with saliva is the odd here. Okay, biting and chewing in the mouth, contraction of the muscles in the stomach, pushing food by prostalysis, all of them are mechanical, while the digestion of the salivary amylase to the food in the mouth is a chemical digestion. Question number 72. In the figure below, the question mark represents a common feature between both species. What is it? A, lung, B, jaws, C, scales, D, gills. And here we have tadpole and shark. What is common between tadpole and shark? Yeah, both of them, yes, performing the process of gas exchange via gills. Yes, exactly. G lungs, it's not, not found in any one of them. Joe's actually, tadpole do not have scales. The tadpole is smooth, it is amphibian, while shark has. So the common here is the gills. Question number 73. In the figure below, which part of the process of water and useful substances reabsorption takes place? One, two, three, and four. And he brought you the figure of a nephron. This is nephron. Every kidney has one median nephron. So where in particular the process of selective reabsorption of water and useful substances takes place? If you don't know the answer, label the diagram, then you're going to find it out. So number one here is the Bowman's capsule or renal capsule. Renal or Bowman's. Bowman's capsule. And inside this, the process of ultrafiltration will be occurred. Ultra. Ultrafiltration. Then uh, number two here, there is the renal or uh, arteriole. Okay, it is renal. After you. And from which there will be efferent and afferent. Okay, that is divided into afferent plus efferent arterioles that will be entered and exited from the uh, Bowman's capsule. Number three is, uh, it's not that clear by the way, but I think it is the a distal convoluted tubule because this is the proximal means close or proximal it's called proximal convoluted tubule and three here is distal convoluted 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 mean folded tubule mean a small tube okay and four is the collecting tubule it's called collecting Collecting tubule, okay, tube. Okay, so ultrafiltration occurred in the renal uh, capsule and the filtrate will be in the, um, yes, in the lumen of the renal uh, capsule. And then the 
process of selective reabsorption will be occurred in proximal and distal and loop of Henle. I didn't point it out. Yes, this loop, this loop is known as loop of Henle. Loop of Henle. And after the process of ultrafiltration, there will be a process that is known as selective reabsorption. Selective reabsorption. So in which all of the useful substances, okay, the needed, I will not say all of the water, but the needed water, because the excess will be, yes, will be excreted. Needed water plus salts and all of amino acid also all of the monosaccharide such like glucose will be reabsorbed selectively and the remaining will be, of course, the urea and the degraded hormone, the metabolic waste, those will be expelled outside, plus excess uh, water and excess salts. And here is the whole process of the um, excretion, by the way. Yes, here is the answer. And here is the explanation and extension for the answer. Yes, and here is the nephron, by the way, the basic functional unit of the um, kidney. Question number 74, one of the blood components that indicates a bacterial infection is A, red blood cells, B, platelets, C, white blood cells, D, plasma. What, of the blood, what, is, what is the blood component that will be increased just in case there is a bacterial infection? Of course, the white blood cells that are, yes, part of the immune system and they are fight against the uh, pathogens and the invaders. And in this case, is bacterial infection. Question number 75, which of the following organelles increase in the brain cells? A, ribosomes, B, nucleus, C, endoplasmic reticulum, D, mitochondria. What is the uh, microorgan or the organelle that will be increased in case of the, uh, or, or in the brain? What does the brain need? So, why this organelle is found there in um, excess amounts. Of course, the nerve impulse, the generation of the nerve impulse needed a lot of energy in order to allow the process of transmission of the nerve impulse. And this energy will be given by the mitochondria. So the correct answer is mitochondria. Yes, ribosome for protein uh, synthesis nucleus uh, actually has no issue here. The endoplasmic reticulum that may attach to its ribosome, so the process of protein synthesis may be occurred. But in the brain, for generation and transmission of the nerve embers, we need a lot, a lot of energy in order to do the active transport. And this process needs a great deal of energy. Okay, and this energy will be. Uh, released by a aerobic respiration process that is occurred, yes, by the mitochondria. Question number 76. The maximum number of individuals of a particular species that the environment can support, A, biomass, B, population density, C, carrying capacity, D, immigration. It is the carrying capacity. And if we extend the explanation a little bit, I'm going to say that here in case of the logistic growth, the first phase is a slow growth, which is known as the, what we can name it, uh, lag phase with a lag, slow growth. Then there are resources and there will be, uh, there, it will followed by a, we can say exponential growth, but till reaching the carrying capacity. Afterwards, it will be level off. It will be plateaued, it will be stopped, it will be remain constant. Why? Because the um, they, they environment do not have a plentiful resources. So there is a limited resources. This type of growth is known as logistic growth, in which begins with a period of slow growth or log, followed by exponential growth, 
okay? As the population grows, the resources becomes more limited. And because there is no plentiful resources, the population eventually will level off, okay? At the size or the maximum size the environment can support. And this is exactly the definition of the carrying capacity. Unlike the exponential growth, which in this case there's a plentiful resources, so it occurs when the population size increase greatly over time. But in this case, there are plentiful resources so that the exponential growth will not be stopped. Immigration with E means exiting of the uh, members of a population from the population. And opposite to it, contradict to it is the immigration, okay? Immigration with I is in, okay, which is the movement of uh, individuals into a population. Immigration with I more causing the population density to increase. With E, immigration causing the population density to decrease. Okay, in the same context here, we have death. The death rate causing the population density to be decreased. And immigration plus birth, also it's opposite, causing the, uh, the population growth to be increased. Yes. Question number 77. What is the number of bacteria resulted from mitotic division after one hour in the normal conditions? If you know what the rate by which the bacteria is growing, you will answer the question. Try to think about it. He said normal condition, which means favorable conditions. What are the intervals by which the bacteria in the favorable condition can undergo one successive mitotic division. Keep in mind that it takes 20 minutes. And if you keep this in mind, starting from zero to 20, then from 20 to 40, then from 40 to 60. So start by one at, okay, 20 minutes, you have two, and at 40, the two will be four. And at 60, the four will be eight. So the proper answer here is eight. Yes. And it's a one hour, one hour. Yeah, the correct answer here is eight. Question number 78. The bony fish have an advantage over the cartilaginous fish that the bony fish have. A, gills, B, jaws, C, swim bladder, D, scales. So what is present in the bony fish and absence in the cartilaginous fish? Try to think about it. Try to think about it. Of course, it is the swim bladder. The swim bladder is only characterizing the bony fish, which is absent in case of the cartilaginous fish. Just like the greasy grouper here. It has a bladder because it is a, yes, it's a bony fish. Question number 79, the most endangered animals that lives in A, forest, B, desert, C, islands, D, oceans. Which is the most accepted answer here? Of course, it's the islands because it is isolated. Forest, there are organisms that go in and out, there are rains, there are flourishing a lot, a lot. The most biodiversity is in the forest. Desert, even it's scarce of many things, but still it's open place and organisms can get in and get out. Oceans are the same. They have oceanic zones and there are a lot of organisms that can move from one place to another. So a lot of living organisms can be flourishing, okay, and thriving in the oceans. While isolated islands, they are a subject of the uh, isolation. So the animals may be uh, under the risk of endangerness. Sorry, question number eight. Bird that feed on nectar has a peak that A, long and thin, B, sharp and curved, C, wide and plant, D, short and pointed. For sure, it has to be long and thin. Okay, why? Let's extend the explanation. Have a look here. The hummingbird, for example. Hummingbirds, they are feed on the nectar. They have long and thin and narrow peak in order to allow them to reach the nectar, okay, inside the flower, okay? 
And unwritten or un un contrary, he, the duck, for example, they have yeah long, flattened, rounded pill or their peak, such like, yeah, here is the option. Sharp and curved, yes, of course, this is a, a predatory bird. They have curved, they have pointed peak for, yes, pulling apart the prey. And is they, such like falcon, such like the eagle, yeah. Long and thin, such like the hummingbird, we said this. Yes, short and pointed, yes, those have short and pointed, such like the cardinal, for example. Yeah, here is short and pointed, yes. Question number 81. Colorblind person couldn't differentiate between which colors. It came in the exam last Saturday, and the options are red and green, B, gray and brown, C, black and white, D, yellow and orange. I think that all of you now are experts. Yes. Yes, yes, my dear. And it is the red and green. And I did mention that actually, yeah, yeah, I, I said that we have three types. We have the red only, and we have green only, and we have red and green, which is the worst. And the problem actually is in the uh, cones, okay? You know that we have rods and cones, and the cones have, okay, our three groups. We have red, we have blue, we have green, RBG. Each one is uh, responsible for the absorption of a specific, okay, spectrum. Okay, that together collectively within the range of the red color, same for the blue, same for the green. The person that have red will face a problem for the uh, spectrum that is being uh, among is the red color. The green will be also safe, uh, facing the same issue, but within the spectrum, um, which um, among is the uh, range of the green color, but the worst is both of them, red and green, which is extremely hard. Question number 82, behavior in which an animal benefits another uh, animal at a cost of itself. Altruistic, migratory, nourishing, coaching. Exactly, it's a altruistic relationship, which is very common in the, um, the bees. Exactly, the altruistic behavior, animal benefits another at a cost of itself, such like workers in the beehives perform altruistic behavior collecting nectar, caring of the queen, and even the offsprings for the sake of, a, of the hive itself. Question number 83. In human, the sex influence trait is A, skin color, B, color blindness, C, hemophilia, D, boldness. Of course, the boldness is sex influenced. Boldness. Hemophilia is sex linked. It's very common in the yeah, UK royal family, and it's the the boldness is a sex influenced influenced by the male sex hormones. In case and the female sex hormone that is decreased in this uh, process, so that the female gonna be a little bit okay protected. And you know that it, there are three cases, and the male has also two: either to be normal or to be bold. Okay. And normal X, Y, let's say this is um, B small and bold will be X, B capital Y. And the female has three cases normal when they uh, both X have the recessive allele and will be carrier, carrier when we have uh, X, B capital X, B small. Uh, so it's a carrier, show no symptoms, but it can pass down to the office springs. And then we have X, B, capital, X, B, capital. This is supposed to be bold, but in the female, we'll just have hair fall. Why? Because of the female sex hormones. That keeping her protected and the maximum thing in case of the two dominant allele, they hair for. Unlike male, only one dominant can cause him fully bold, and that's it. Okay. Yes, boldness. 
Question number 84. While making a karyotype for a baby, it was found that they had three copies of chromosome number 21. This baby is diagnosed with A, Turner syndrome, B, Kleinfilter syndrome, C, Down syndrome, D, Harari syndrome. Of course, this will be Down syndrome. And if we extend our explanation, we're going to say that we have, yes, the chromosome number 21 has two cubbies due to uneven distribution, non-disjunction, but in the autosomal genes, not in the uh, six genes. And we discussed this question before in a very, very uh, detailed manner. Question number 85. Which of the following organisms detect the odor by Jacobson's organ? A, salamander, B, crocodile, C, frog, D, snake. So what do they... Yeah, exactly, the snake. And if we extend that, we can just yeah, bring here the Jacobson's organ that play a very important role, making the, yes, the, um, the snake here to precisely detecting the order. Question number 86. What is the type of animal dispersion in the following figure? A, clump dispersion, B, uniform dispersion, C, random dispersion, the logistic dispersion. Here is a uniform dispersion. How come? Try to calculate the distance between each okay, point representing an organism. You're going to find that they are roughly equal. So there is even distribution. There is even distribution, which is very common in birds, for example. So this type of the um, this type of dispersion is known as uniform. Let's extend the explanation. It is uniform, but what is the dispersion? The population dispersion is the way in which individuals of a population are distributed or spread out in an area. We have three types of population dispersion. We have clump dispersion, which is very common in the fish, for example such like many fish species swim together in large groups to avoid predators. And this is a clump dispersion. There's a clump cluster, we can say, group. Yes, so better for mating, better for protection, okay, better for searching for resources. And we have the second type, which is the uh, uniform dispersion. So birds show the territorial, yes, they are territorial. They have territory that each one has to respect it, each of them protecting its own space or territory, showing here the uniform dispersion, the same figure that we answered. And eventually we have uh, animals such like the three-toed uh, sloth, okay, have almost no com uh, competitors for, um, or even uh, very few predators, so they are showing random dispersion. They have no, okay, dispersion. Uh, noticed. So it is called random dispersion. And here are the three different dispersion by which all of the animals will be spread out or distributed in a given area. Question number 88. The immovable joints in the human found in A. Skull, B. Knee, C. Shoulder, D. Pelvis. And this is a new question, by the way. It didn't come before. Of course, the immovable joints are found in the skull. Yes, let's extend it a little bit. We have three types of joints. The joints, first of all, what the meaning of joints? What is the meaning of joint? Joints are, are okay, place where bone meet bone. Okay, we have three types. Number one is immovable. Such like the sutures. And those sutures are joints that are found in the skull. Okay, as you know, skull is made up of 22 bones and all of them are yes, having joints between them. But all of the skull bones, okay, except for the lower joint, of course, this is the only bone that is moving in the skull. The rest are, yes, having immovable joints or the sutures. Then we have second type, which is known as cartilaginous, 
cartilaginous. Cartilaginous, by the way, has a slight movement called slightly movable. Slightly movable. Yeah, such like those that are found in the sternum bone that we answer in the beginning of our trial today. The sternum bone, between those bones, there are drains. And between those joints, there is a cartilage. And they are slightly moving. Even the ribs, there is a, a slightly move, movable or slight movement. And this is a um, second type of a joint, which is known as cartilage that has slight range of movement. Then we have the, yes, the, the synovial. Synovial joints. The synovial joints, they are freely movement. Free, okay, movement. Okay. This is the first type that came in one question before, which is ball and socket, in which there is one bone has a head which is resting in a socket-like structure of the other bone, such like the shoulder and the, um, yes, the uh, shoulder joint and the hip joint, okay? Both of them are ball and socket. It's 360 movement. This is the maximum range of movement. Okay, again, instead, we have the hinge, by the way, such like the elbow that came in two question in SAT before, in which there is one bone that have a convex ending and the other one has a concave endings. So they rest on it, such like the elbow. You can straight your elbow, yes, but to a maximum, to a maximum limit, no, to a limited range, such like the hinge of the door. Okay, so there is a limited range of movement, limited. We have the pivot, pivot, very famous example, even much easier than this that is found in your neck. Okay, so it is very, very uh, obvious, okay, that the, the pivot or the pivot joint, the uh, gliding is the movement by which those small bones or they, yes, the carpal bone will be moving. We have here small bones. Okay, so they are moving by the uh, gliding. We have saddle, such like those found here, by the way. It's called saddle joints. All of those are the joints that we need to know in the uh, SA80. Those that came in example and socket came once, hinge came once. Uh, sutures, this is the first time to come, so it is new question, but we illustrated this before, okay. Uh, pivot didn't come, gliding didn't come, but just to know, I introduced uh, them to you. Question number 89. Red and white blood cells and platelets are formed in A, yellow bone marrow, B, bone cells, C, red bone marrow, D, bone cavity. Of course, they are made in the red bone marrow. We illustrated this a couple of minutes and we mentioned the adult stem cells. Yeah, adult stem cells here. Yes, which is a blood stem cells, an example of it. The other stem cells will um, give rise into a group of a closely related cell, such like RBCs, such like white BCs, such like platelets. All of them are, yes, blood cells. So, yes, this is the differentiation that will be occurred by stem cells, the blood stem cells, which is an example of adult, okay, stem cells. Okay, so watch out. Let's carry on. The last question today is, which of the following uh, accepts the returning blood from the body? A, right atrium. B, left atrium. C, right ventricle. D, left ventricle. What's the correct answer here and why? Answer here is A, which is right atrium. Why? Let's extend our explanation. If you are in doubt, get it out. So let's go for the exclusion first. Left atrium. The left atrium receiving the blood return from the body? No, it is receiving the blood that is back from the lungs. So it is not the correct answer. Right ventricle. Right ventricle, okay, receiving. No, the ventricles are bumping. So we will... Okay, exclude all of the ventricles. And if I extend the explanation of the heart a little bit, because it's, it is extremely important, I can divide the heart into up and down. Okay, sorry, I will repeat it here. Here. Up is atria for receiving the blood. Down is ventricle 
ventricles for bumping, pushing, squeezing the blood. Okay. Also, I can differentiate it into another way, which is, yeah, like this. Okay, right and left. Right and left. The right has oxygenated blood. Oxygenated, or we can say oxygen rich, by the way. Oxygen rich blood. Why the left has, uh, sorry, deoxygenated in the right, deoxygenated, and oxygen poor. Oxygen poor. Yes. Here, deoxygenated. Or oxygen poor. While the left has oxygenated or oxygen rich blood. We have a double circulation. Double circulation, actually, number one, we have pulmonary circulation and we have systemic circulation. The pulmonary circulation is starting here in the right atrium when the superior vena cava draining the deoxygenated blood or the oxygen poor blood from the uh, upper body parts and the inferior vena cava drain the um, deoxygenated blood from the lower body parts of the body and both of them will, yes, deliver it to the right atrium here in the right atrium. Then the right atrium will be contracted, pushing the blood down, okay, to the right ventricle then the right ventricle will be contracted pushing the blood up through pulmonary artery pulmonary artery divided into to the left lung and right lung and in the lung the process of gas exchange takes place gas exchange after the process of gas exchange occurred the blood will be oxygenated and will be converted from oxygen poor into oxygen rich blood the oxygen-rich blood will be moving from the left and right lung through pulmonary veins and will be, yes, will be delivered to the left atrium. And here is the final destination of pulmonary circulation. Then we have the systemic circulation in which when the oxygenated blood delivered into the left atrium, left atrium will be contracting, bumping and pushing, squeezing the blood down to the left atrium, to the left ventricle, sorry. The left ventricle will be in return contracting and bumping and pushing the blood upwards through the aorta, which is the main artery in the body. The aorta is branched into a lot, a lot of vessels and uh, arterioles to every single part of the body, okay? And delivering oxygenated or oxygen-rich blood to every single uh, part of the body systems and tissues and organs. And after the body takes in the oxygenated blood, will make use of the oxygen and, of course, nutrients and metabolic processes will be occurred. As a result, carbon dioxide will be released and waste product that will be delivered from the upper body parts through the superior vena cava and from the lower body parts through the inferior vena cava back again into the right atrium. And here is the systemic circulation.